Dr. Carl R. Rogers is noted for his significant contribution to psychological treatment described as non-directive or client-centered psychotherapy. From his keen clinical observations, he developed the baseline for personality research and a theory of personality which focuses on the self and experience. Dr. Rogers' classic debates with B.F. Skinner led to a fascinating study in contrast between the experience-oriented view of man, which he upheld, versus the behavior-oriented view of Dr. Skinner. After receiving his Ph.D. in psychology from Columbia University in 1931, he has held posts at the Rochester Guidance Center, Ohio State University, the University of Chicago, and the University of Wisconsin. He is presently a resident fellow at the Center for Studies of the Person in La Jolla, California. His current interests range from a continuing interest in personality theory and psychotherapy to the encounter group movement and our formal educational system. He is the author of a number of widely discussed books, including the now classic Counseling and Psychotherapy, and most recently, Freedom to Learn and Carol Rogers on Encounter Groups. Among his many distinctions was his election to the presidency of the American Psychological Association. It was for us a genuine pleasure to complete this one of two film dialogues with Dr. Rogers in the study of his home in La Jolla, California. For Dr. Rogers, to begin our discussion, I'd like to sort of relate uh, some of your views to three of the rather important uh, dimensions that are almost always dealt with in psychology, namely motivation, perception, and learning. Beginning, first of all, with motivation, of course, we in psychology have tended to define this that as all conditions which arouse, direct, and sustain the organism. And of course, most prevalent has been a kind of a homeostatic model that uh, we, we take into biology that we're always trying to reduce tensions and ma maintain a state of equilibrium. I don't agree with that point of view because I think that uh, the organism is definitely not trying to achieve stasis. I think the, uh, even uh, organisms as low as the flatworm are always uh, trying to look for more enriching stimuli, more complicated stimuli. So that, uh, that approach is not very uh, congenial with my point of view. In other words, you wouldn't accept the homeostatic model. No. You feel that a uh, man is almost striving for uh, tension. Always. I think that uh, there's plenty of evidence now that that's true. We call it, in man, we tend to call it curiosity. In lower animals, that's uh, a tendency to, to seek uh, more complicated stimuli rather than simple ones. There have been, of course, an attempt in, in psychology to begin to look at very specific needs and try to develop uh, our understanding of them, how they come about, how they develop them. One current example that uh, McClellan and Atkinson have dealt with just to illustrate one of these is so-called need for achievement. Who do you think there's value in psychology to taking a specific need and going back and trying to study early patterns that formulated? Well, I think it was of value to McClellan, and, and um, uh, I think there is truth in some truth in all of these approaches. I think I'd rather, um, rather than try to comment on those, I'd rather say something about my own view of it. Yes. Uh, for instance, I was showing you these uh, two perspegonias that, I'm yes. that I raised. Um, now we might ask, what motivates a two perspegonia? Um, to grow from a little two-inch bulb to these uh, really beautiful plants and flowers. Um, well, it seems to me that we could say there must be a need for achievement because some of those blooms and when they're in their prime <laughs> are nine inches across. We could say there's a sex drive because the male and female flowers grow on the same flower stalk. Well, of course, that's poppycock, and I think it's uh, pretty much poppycock in regard to human beings. It's not that those things uh, you, can, you can describe the behaviors, but I think that the, uh, the much more basic thing is that every organism has a tendency to maintain itself, to enhance itself if possible, uh, eventually to reproduce itself. Um, and uh, to me, that basic tendency toward growth, toward maintaining and enhancing the organism, is uh, the central aspect of all motivation. Now you can you can say yes, and some of that goes into a uh, uh, seems to be describable as a need for achievement. Um, 
system that certainly is uh, uh, channeled into a sexual drive and so forth, but um, I prefer to emphasize what to me is much more basic than any of those single uh, concepts. Now, of course, uh, the same homeostatic model we're talking about uh, has related somewhat to Freudian theory. Uh, let's start out perhaps by talking about his uh, construct of the unconscious. Uh, how do you regard uh, this, this construct of the unconscious? Well, I think uh, that I see the same sort of phenomena that uh, Freud saw and for which he developed this uh, concept of the unconscious. I think that psychologists in general, and perhaps psychology students especially, tend to make things out of these uh, uh, concepts where really they're the attempt by someone to uh, understand a, an observable set of phenomena. Uh, I prefer to think of uh, a range from uh, sharp focus in awareness right now, uh, which is the height of consciousness, through uh, a range of material that could be called into consciousness that you really know and can call into consciousness, but you don't have it uh, in, in figure right now. It really is in ground. Then on to some others that are more and more dimly connected with awareness to material that uh, is really um, prevented from coming into awareness because if it did come into awareness it would uh, damage the person's uh, concept of himself. So uh, in a way then you're agreeing to some, to some extent with Freud's view but you more or less uh, are seeing this perhaps in a uh, more of a relative sense. Yes. Uh, you see what I feel is that um, to say I agree or disagree with Freud's concept of the unconscious is not very helpful. Neither mm -hmm. statement is very helpful. Yes. So I'd rather um, point out that the way I conceptualize the same kind of phenomena is along this uh, spectrum, this, this continuum from uh, material that would be too threatening to even permit into awareness at all to material that is uh, right sharply in focus at, at the immediate moment. But you spoke a few moments ago, of course, of sexual motivation, and of course we, we know that uh, Freud emphasized sexual motivation very heavily in his, particularly his early work, and in particular his classic model of psychosexual development has been, of course, very influential. How do you feel about this notion? Well, I think that uh, there is a germ of truth in all of that. I think that... Uh, Freud was very much a creature of his time in placing the uh, great stress that he did on the uh, sexual aspect of development. Personally, I would uh, uh, be more concerned with the development of the whole concept of self in the individual as he grows, and that, to be sure, is influenced by uh, uh, attitudes and values and so on, uh, and perceptions, which he interjects from significant figures in his early life and all the way on up. I think that it's um, somewhat artificial to divide the uh, development of a child into hard and fast uh, stages, but um, there, there certainly is a uh, uh, gradual development of the picture that he carries of himself, and uh, that, as I say, is to me more important than just focusing on one aspect of that, the, uh, the sexual aspect of it. That, that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you feel that these early childhood experiences uh, uh, can more or less continue to determine uh, the individual behavior over and over again? Do uh, you think they're that powerful in their impact? Yes, I think that um, early experience is a, uh, is a powerful force. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, attitudes and values that are interjected from the parent do have a continuing influence and consequently would uh, repeatedly influence the uh, behavior. It's, um, you see, all along through here, I'm, I'm objecting to putting hard and fast, tight labels. I don't like the pigeonholes that uh, Freudian theory has developed into and other theories, too. I think uh, uh, people handicap their thinking when they um, 
think in terms of, of so many labels. I'd rather they observe the phenomena itself. Mm -hmm. Well, moving away from our kind of brief discussion of motivation, or another very central area in psychology is the area of perception. And as you certainly are aware, in the last uh, several years, there have been some rather interesting developments in the area of perception. We uh, have moved perhaps from, a, from an interest in the more precise studies of perception where we're trying to study sensory processes and relating the person's response to a very specific stimulus to where we're getting uh, feeling and interest in the overall response, the sort of thing that William James calls stream of consciousness. And mm -hmm. the naive, immediate experience of the individual as a whole may be more interesting to many psychologists today than the very precise reactions to specific stimuli. Uh, how do you regard this trend? Do you feel that uh, this type of uh, movement to phenomenology is in line with your own interests? Yes, very definitely. I think that um, to, uh, well, that I, I really am characteristic of the trend that you mentioned. I recognize the, the narrow field of perception as a neurological event, as a field very worthy of study, but it is of relatively little uh, interest to me. I am more interested in the um, whole gestalt of what the person perceives in his environment, in himself, and so on. Uh, and uh, I think that one thing that uh, seems very true to me is that um, there is no such thing, I believe, as a perception without a meaning. That is, the human organism immediately attaches a meaning to whatever is perceived. I may, out of the corner of my eye, see a uh, plane in the distance. But then if I turn my head that way, I discover it's a little map uh, flying close by. Now, um, in other words, in each case, I attach a meaning to that perception immediately, even though it may be an erroneous meaning as in that case. And um, for me, the um, perception is reality as far as the individual is concerned. I don't even know whether there is an objective reality. Probably there is. But none of us ever really know that. All we know is what we perceive, and we try to test that in various ways. And if, if it seems to be perceived in the same way from several different aspects, we regard it as real. Um, so that uh, the world of reality for the individual is his own field of perception with the meanings he has attached to those uh, uh, various aspects. And I think that the, uh, that probably any organism, certainly the human organism, um, is always trying to uh, satisfy its needs as they are experienced in the uh, total field as he uh, perceives it, in the, in, the, in the reality as he perceives it. Well, would you go so far as uh, agreeing with Immanuel Kant paraphrasing him uh, very briefly when he said something like this, that there is no reality except in terms of man's perception of it. Would you go that far? Yes, I would. I have tried stating that sometimes and find that it always leads to sort of fruitless argument, so I, uh, <laughs> I don't uh, say so very often. But uh, uh, it really fits in with what I said a moment ago. Yeah. We None of us know for sure uh, what constitutes objective reality and that we live our whole lives in the reality as perceived. Well, we've talked about motivation, we've talked a little bit about perception, trying to cover the vast areas in a mm -hmm. few minutes. But of course, another very fundamental construct in psychology is that of learning. If I read your work correctly, you would uh, apparently be moving more in the direction, being more in agreement with the Tolmanian view, of the emphasis of cognition, rather than the uh, highly behavior-centered in other words, you're more would uh, have a, be more interested in experience as we study learning, and uh, not necessarily just simply focusing on behavior. Yes, that's uh, I think it would be closer to that uh, uh, view. Um, I've never been particularly interested in the atomistic theories of learning. I used to think when that was primarily in vogue, it seemed to me that learning theory was a very boring subject. Um, I think that uh, the kind of view I have of learning uh, is not entirely cognitive either. I think it is holistic, that the individual 
learns with the whole organism, which includes affect as well as uh, as well as cognition. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, desire uh, to enrich the stimuli with which one is faced is a very deep desire. Uh, out of it grows our whole desire for play. And as I've known uh, uh, prominent scientists, I think that they are strongly motivated by that notion of play. They like to play with new ideas, new theories, new possibilities, new hunches. And uh, uh, it's like the small child, too, who uh, is continuously on the go, on the move, to uh, one reason why he's so uh, hard to manage and get along with, uh, is because he's continually trying to learn about his environment in all sorts of ways, some of which uh, don't quite fit in with adult notions. And I think that uh, uh, this, this desire for learning, this desire to, to grasp something that is meaningful to the self, to the person at the moment, is uh, something that needs to be nurtured rather than molded. This is why I um, grow a little uh, fearful of some of the possible results of the use of operant conditioning and so on. I think it's been a big contribution in, in many ways. It also has its uh, somewhat uh, frightening aspects. And I would like to see instead individuals encouraged to uh, uh, follow their very deep desire to learn, to enrich, to grow, to create. Uh, that's what I think is the um, most essential part of, of learning. And it is highly spontaneous um, when the person feels that it is related to his own needs and to his own desire to enhance himself. Now, moving away from these uh, rather fundamental constructs that we've been talking about so far, motivation, perception, learning. Uh, I, looking more specifically at some of the sorts of things that seem to be uh, involved in your own writings and research over the years, and mm -hmm. you've already mentioned the self and your answers mm -hmm. to some of these other mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Jung used the word self in a certain way. Freud used the word ego in a certain way. Mm -hmm. What is the self as you see it? Uh, I think I might lead up to that by saying why I, bec I became interested in that uh, particular construct. I certainly didn't start psychological work being interested in anything as vague as the self. To me, that seemed like uh, old-fashioned introspectionism. Uh, who would be interested in that? I was really forced to examine it because, um, uh, and, and forced to define it for myself, because my clients in therapy um, kept using that term in all kinds of significant ways. Uh, they'd say, um, I think I've got a pretty solid self uh, underneath this kind of phony exterior, or, um, or quite the opposite. I'd be terribly afraid of, of getting to know my real self. Um, all kinds of, of ways in which they showed that for them this was a significant construct, and I couldn't help but decide that uh, if it was significant for them, then maybe I should take a, a more direct look at it. And the kind of definition that I give it, the kind of meaning it has for me, is that um, the self includes all of the perceptions the individual has of his organism, of his experience, and the way in which uh, those perceptions are related to others in his environment, to objects in his environment, uh, to the whole exterior world. Um, so that it is a, it is a uh, complex pattern of perceptions of the uh, individual as he perceives himself, and in relation to uh, uh, in relation to himself, and in relation to many uh, uh, experiences and realities outside of himself. Now, of course, uh, as we begin looking at your view of the self, uh, it, it obviously seems to have connected with it some notion of growth. I wonder if you might like to develop this a little bit. Uh, what, what, what do we mean by self-actualization? 
Well, I think that, uh, uh, to put it first in sort of a, uh, an ideal way, uh, the organism is always endeavoring to actualize itself. That's what I was saying, really, when I was talking about motivation. And um, when the self uh, is an awareness of what is going on in the organism, then it keeps changing and growing and developing in the same way that the organism does. Now, interestingly enough, uh, in most of us, there are static aspects of the self, and that really is what constitutes maladjustment. It's when um, I persist in holding a set view of myself, uh, which doesn't correspond with what's actually going on in my organism, uh, that's maladjustive. Uh, to take an extreme example, I think of a boy I knew a long time ago. Uh, he'd been raised in a very strict home, a uh, very strictly religious home. He had no sex feelings. He had no sex desires. Um, that was a part of his self-picture. Um, then I saw him because he was arrested for lifting the skirts of some little girls. Um, in other words, his organism was experiencing all kinds of sexual curiosity and desire and so forth. But as far as his self-picture was concerned, that was not a part of it at all. In fact, it was quite typical that when he was arrested, he said, that couldn't have been him. That couldn't have been him. He could not have done that. And in the strictly technical sense, his self-picture couldn't do it, didn't do it. In that sense, he's right. It was his organism that uh, was experiencing all these uh, drives and acting on them. Now, to change that to a picture of adjustment, he would need to be aware of and accepting of his sexual drive as well as his other uh, aspects of himself. Then his picture of himself would match what was going on within his organism, and I would say he would be much closer then to, to psychological adjustment. Uh, so that um, to return to the question of self-actualization, um, it's as the person is aware, uh, acceptantly aware of what's going on within, and uh, uh, is consequently changing in practically every moment and moving on in complexity and so on, that's what I regard as, uh, as self-actualization. Now, uh, in this same respect, uh, phrases such as ideal self versus real self are used. Now, uh, how would you relate uh, these terms to uh, our discussion? Those uh, grew up in our attempt to uh, measure the self-perception. I might say that uh, one reason I was so reluctant to use the concept of the self was I thought, if I get into anything that big, uh, we can never measure it, we can never do research. Uh, that's why uh, William Stevenson's development of the Q technique came along at just the right moment as far as I was concerned, because here was a way of getting a, um, an objective picture of this highly subjective phenomenon, the self. And uh, then we realized that uh, a person does not value uh, every aspect of himself. Uh, and so we did ask the uh, subject in our research to sort the, the cue cards for a picture of the self they would like to be, uh, which uh, gave the uh, uh, picture the ideal self as compared with the self as currently perceived. And that proved to be quite a, uh, a valuable way of uh, bringing objectivity into the study of this uh, very ephemeral uh, phenomenon. You get the valued self as against the currently perceived self and can make all kinds of interesting comparisons. Pursuing a little further uh, this whole question of self, uh, of course, there are certain uh, very important, uh, you might say almost resolutions that the human organism must uh, undergo. But I wonder if you might develop what you really mean by this idea of congruency versus incongruency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think um, 
All right, I'll speak first about incongruence. That um, when the individual's experience is quite discrepant from the way he has organized himself. Um, a common example, and one of a rather different sort than I gave before, is the person who is convinced that he's intellectually inferior. Um, now he may actually do very creative and good things that show he has a fine intellect. Um, he can't believe those. So there is a um, discrepancy between the picture he has of himself and what he is actually experiencing. Um, and that's what we call incongruence. Um, what we are working toward in counseling or therapy is toward a greater congruence of self and experience so that the uh, uh, individual is both uh, able to be aware of what he's experiencing, uh, which is means that he's not too defensively organized. He's able to be aware of even uh, things which might change his concept of himself and can organize those into the gestalt of uh, uh, that he holds in regard to self. Um, then we've used the term in another way, too, though with the same meaning, but in another respect. Uh, we've found that the congruence in the therapist is very important in the relationship. In other words, that it is very important for the therapist to be himself in this relationship. He, too, may be an incongruent person in other ways, but it's uh, important that in the therapeutic relationship he should uh, be what he is experiencing. And uh, otherwise, he comes across to the client as a little bit phony or somewhat of a facade, and therapy is not nearly so likely to, uh, to take place. So um, one description I've given of, of what it means to be congruent in a given moment is to be aware of what's going on in your experiencing at that moment, uh, to be uh, acceptant toward that experience, to be able to uh, voice it if it's if it's appropriate, at any rate, to be able to express it in some uh, uh, in some behavioral way. Well, of course, uh, you've introduced the notion of therapy in your answer to the last question, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rogers, and of course, this leads us to one of the most obvious, I guess, areas of discussion that anyone would ever have with Carl Rogers, and this has to do with, of course, your very significant contribution to the area of psychotherapy. So I guess your 1942 book uh, sort of begins to set the stage for this, but in those days you were talking about uh, non-directive psychotherapy, and uh, as time went by you began using terms like client-centered psychotherapy, but sort of studying this evolution, uh, how did you kind of arrive at this kind of formulation? I was, um, I sort of guessed you might be raising some questions along <laughs> that line. Uh, and I was thinking about it uh, yesterday in terms of the, of the books that I've written. And uh, it really goes back further than you, than you mentioned, because um, my book, The Clinical Treatment of the Problem Child, um, which was really written in 1936 and 37, that was published in 39, uh, shows where I stood at that point. I was working with children then. My whole aim was to um, manipulate the conditions under which the child lived uh, so as to improve his adjustment. Uh, we made a diagnosis of the child's situation. We developed a treatment plan. We brought in all the different agencies, the school and the court and whatever was needed uh, to make sure that that plan was carried through. So that shows my approach to, to at least the child at that time was on the whole a, a planful but basically manipulative approach. Then um, you will find traces in that book of a beginning mm -hmm. notion of something a little more than that, a little bit more... Uh, attempt to get in touch with the individual that uh, you're dealing with. Then, um, by 1942, when counseling and psychotherapy came out, um, quite a little of that was still directed negatively. Don't diagnose, don't advise, don't interpret. But um, 
it did have as its central theme the notion that the uh, uh, potential for better health resided in the in the client, and uh, it certainly was quite a technique-oriented book. Uh, the counselor's responses were to be of a sort which would uh, uh, enable the client's potential to to develop. Then. Um, Client-Centered Therapy, which was written oh, in 1949 and 50 and published in 51. Um, there, that the hypothesis was becoming a little more sophisticated, that the um, counselor's uh, basic premise was that the individual has uh, sufficient capacity to deal with the, all those aspects of his life which uh, can come into awareness. And so the uh, uh, counselor endeavored to create an interpersonal situation in which uh, material could come into awareness. Um, there was a great deal of stress on both the philosophical and attitudinal characteristics uh, of the therapist um, and, and a definite move away from techniques. Um, and perhaps a little bit of groping toward a closer personal relationship. But it was at that time, I think, that I began to formulate the, the three conditions of, of therapy, which I'll mention a little more fully in a few moments. Uh, then in 1961, when I published uh, Unbecoming a Person, that contained papers from 1953 to 1960, I guess, um, the... I'd come to recognize quite fully that the therapist must be present as a person in the relationship if uh, therapy is to take place. It is a much more, um, much more an eye-thou kind of relationship that developed between uh, uh, the therapist and the client. Buber, of course, used these terms, mm -hmm. eye-thou, and I notice in your writing you have, from time to time, used these terms. I think that. Uh, some of Buber's phrases would do the best job, but uh, when there is a real timeless immediacy in the relationship, when you're aware of nothing but this other person and he's aware of, of nothing but you, uh, and there is a um, deep sense of communication and unity uh, between the two of you, that's the thing that I refer to as an I thou uh, Which is in contrast to what? In other words? In contrast to an I it relationship where I'm seeing you as a complex object, uh, a, uh, a machine whose functions may have uh, uh, be in disrepair in certain ways and so on. The, the whole, uh, uh, well the whole diagnostic look at an individual is in sharp contrast to uh, an I thou kind of relationship. Yes. Now, if I can put together what you said, then, in your earlier work, you were trying to really explore the techniques involved in this relationship, and then you began to move into really exploring the properties of this I thou relationship, if I uh, understand you correctly. Now, going back for a moment to the techniques, you were emphasizing reflection between client mm -hmm. and uh, counselor. How far can you reflect without directing? This is such a uh, disturbing thought that obviously many people were perplexed by it. Have you undergone any changes yourself in, in how non-directive or client-centered one can really be? That is, would you say that today you perhaps have qualified somewhat this notion of being non-directive? No, I think uh, perhaps enriched it, but not really um, qualified that. I still feel that the uh, person who should guide the client's life is the client. And um, my whole philosophy and whole approach is to try to strengthen him in that uh, um, way of being, that uh, he's in charge of his own life, and nothing that I say is intended to uh, um, take that uh, capacity, that opportunity, away from him. Now, um, it has changed in this respect that I would try to be aware of my own feelings, too, um, and express those as my feelings, but without imposing them on him. Uh, even even uh, negative feelings. I might uh, tell a client, I'm really bored by what you're saying. Um, 
That doesn't guide him. It does provide him with some perhaps rather jolting data which he must uh, handle in some way or other. But uh, uh, I'm not telling him what he should do to avoid boring me. Maybe he would just mm -hmm. as soon bore me. That's up to well, him. Taking this kind of example, I'm sure you really don't mean this literally, but uh, back when you were working in the book of 1942 and with clients in those days, uh, would you have done something like this, uh, actually been uh, made this kind of comment to the, uh, no, to the client? No. no, I wouldn't have. That, at that time, I was um, quite fascinated by the discovery that people did have much more capacity to guide themselves, credit for, and uh, I became sort of a purist in that. Let's not let any of me into the situation except just an understanding of, of the client's feelings. And... Uh, I've gradually realized over the years that uh, that rather purist approach uh, cheats the client of, of what might be a uh, very close interpersonal relationship, which is more, more rewarding. Uh, I might just say that um, what started me, really, in the change from a manipulative to uh, approach to one which rested its confidence in the client, were a number of experiences um, perhaps the most vivid one is one that I think I've written somewhere too. Um, I'd been working with a mother, and one of the other staff members was working with her son, and uh, I was getting nowhere with this mother. I felt she was a rejecting mother. I tried to uh, gently point that out, uh, and uh, really we just made no progress. And after a number of interviews, I said to her, I think we both tried. But uh, I don't think we're getting anywhere, and I would suggest that we just uh, call it quits. And uh, she uh, agreed that she didn't think we were getting very far either. So she got up, uh, started to leave the room, and got as far as the door and said, uh, Do you ever take adults for counseling here? And I said, Yes. And uh, she said, All right. Came back and sat right down again and began to pour out her own problems from her own point of view, which was totally different from the nice case history I'd gotten, and uh, began to really work on the things that concerned her, which were primarily her marriage, not her son at all. And uh, that was the start of a really fruitful therapeutic relationship. And it made me realize that if I wanted to look like a smart psychologist, okay, then go ahead and diagnose and advise and interpret and so on. But if I wanted to be effective in working with people, then I might just as well recognize that they had, this person has the capacity to deal with his own problems, get a climate where he can do it. Mm -hmm. So that since that time, I would say my whole effort has been focused on the kind of psychological climate that helps the individual to, uh, to resolve his problems, to develop, to grow. So in this respect, you were uh, going along pretty much with something pretty close to Lewin's notion of field theory, mm -hmm. that the behavior is a function of the person interacting with his environment. Uh, were you literally affected by Lewin's work? Uh, did you, were you aware of it? And uh Not very sharply aware of it. Uh, as I became aware of it, I realized certainly that I was operating from a field theory base and not from a uh, genetic uh, yeah. theory. Now, another uh, influence that uh, would seem to at least be there in some way was uh, the work of Otto Rock. Now, Rock, of course, was setting kind of a... Uh, time setting, he would say, well, let's, let's finish this up in so many sessions, and such a contrast to three to five years of, you know, of a long psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. uh, were you influenced by Otto Rank? Yes, I was. Um, not so much in that aspect of it, of setting a time limit, but uh, uh, with many of his other ideas of the relationship and focusing more on the immediate present and so on. I was influenced primarily indirectly. Uh, some people who had... Uh, uh, worked with, well, with the Philadelphia School of Social Work, which was quite Ronkian in its orientation, uh, had quite an impact on me. And then uh, two of us brought out a rank to Rochester for a three-day seminar, which was fruitful. Um, uh, I've sometimes said uh, facetiously that in those three days, I didn't think much of his theory, but I thought his therapy was very good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his... Uh, there's no doubt that uh, my therapy was interested, was influenced by his uh, thinking. Certainly to this day, I guess, in, in training 
of counselors, you would, would, I guess, still go along with this idea of the importance of genuine reflection? Well, um, let me talk about the conditions that I feel are necessary to therapy, and I think in doing that I'll, I'll answer your uh, question. Uh, we've uh, gradually built a fairly solid theory and backed it up with some, I think, pretty satisfactory research, which shows that if these conditions are not the uh, ultimate or best statement of uh, uh, what fosters personal growth, or at least an approximation to it. And these um, the three conditions that are very important to uh, have exist in the relationship are, first of all, uh, the therapist's congruence or genuineness his ability to be a real person with the client. That, I think, uh, is uh, the most important of the three conditions. Then perhaps um, second is his ability to accept the client as a separate person um, without, without judging him or evaluating him. It's a, uh, at its best, I think, it's a rather unconditional acceptance that I'm able to accept you as you are. Um, and the third is a real empathic understanding. Now, um, that's, of course, where the term reflection got used. If it is simply reflection, uh, that's no good. That's just a technique. But if it is a desire to understand empathically, to really um, stand in the client's shoes and to see the world from his vantage point, um, and if some of that can be communicated to the client, that I do really see how you feel and understand the way you feel, um, that can be a most releasing kind of experience to, to find that here is a real person who really accepts and understands um, sensitively and accurately just the way the world seems to me. Um, that just seems to pull people forward. It really is fascinating, the effect that that uh, can have. And it is that, I think, that enables the process of therapy to, uh, to go on. In your early work, of course, we're in a position where you had to contend with a very powerful construct that Freud had developed, the construct of transference. And, uh, of course, uh, his, his notion that uh, the therapist was uh, being perceived by this uh, patient uh, in terms of some early relationship with the parent and that there could be positive transfer that would, in which would be love between the therapist and patient or negative transfer that would be hate. The, the interesting thing about Freud's formulation is that, uh, as in so many of his formulations, there is no room for any normal feeling reaction between the two. Uh, it's either transference or counter-transference, but the possibility of, uh, of having a, quote, normal feeling of, of liking toward another person uh, just doesn't fit into his theory. Uh, and I think it's fascinating the way, except among pretty orthodox Freudians, the whole notion of transference and counter-transference now has pretty well faded out of the picture. I think that the phenomenon of transference, as it existed in psychoanalysis, um, was a learned thing. Um, it was fostered by the reactions of the, of the analyst. There's been a tremendous almost a uh, revolution in our whole conception of psychotherapy, and obviously your work has contributed to this, that is we have increasingly moved away from individual face-to-face -face therapy, as you were describing it in your early work, and of course you and your own students began moving into the area of group therapy very early, and of course group therapy is still growing by leaps and bounds. For example, uh, we're, we're dealing with sensitivity training. The early so-called group dynamics orientation has taken on some kind of new directions, and even more, the whole personal growth movement has moved into what we today even call encounter group. In terms of trying to develop this encounter you've been talking about, it seems that suddenly we're saying, let's use every technique, tactile, words, what have you. How do you see yourself in regard to this whole movement? Well, let me focus on the uh, encounter group aspect of it, because I've just uh, completed a book on that, um, and it's a field I'm very much interested in, very much involved in. I think that um, 
in many ways it can, uh, not only can, but in some respects has gone completely wild, and I, I regret that. Uh, I think that in its more, what I regard as its more solid aspect, it's one of the most uh, significant social inventions of this uh, century, um, because it is a way of uh, uh, eliminating alienation and loneliness, of getting people into better communication with one another, of helping them develop the fresh insights into themselves, uh, helping them get feedback from others so that they perceive how they are received by others. Um, it it uh, serves a great many uh, useful purposes. And in my own work in encounter groups, I have uh, very much the same uh, theory and philosophy that I've been uh, talking about. As a group facilitator, I would try to uh, hold much the same attitudes that I was talking about as being uh, effective in individual psychotherapy. In encounter groups, results in that in a relatively short uh, space of time. On our last minute or two, um, what are some of the fears you have about this movement, though? It seems to have gone beyond the bounds of the rational uh, orientation that you've just described. Uh, what, what do you, what, uh, you think that there's some danger here, that these, these offshoots could actually set this whole movement back seriously? Yes, I think uh, that's a definitely. I think that uh, I don't really object basically to people trying various approaches, Zen, mysticism, uh, even nude groups if they want to. The social effect that that will have though is going to be uh, very bad because I think the general public may get turned off and feel that all groups are bad just as uh, quite a number of years ago, they got turned off about progressive education, and, and that became a dirty word. Now, the analogy might be quite close, because uh, uh, public made groups, and yet I'm sure that the kind of things that a, an encounter group experience does for people, that's going to continue. Just as progressive education, was a t as a term, was no longer used, but the ideas, the sound ideas of progressive education have been operating in that field ever ever since. Well, Dr. Rogers, I certainly wanted to thank you very much. Your mm -hmm. responses have been just marvelous. Thank you. Well, it's been very pleasant. Thank you. Mm -hmm.